Okay. And hi, welcome everyone to the Disability Vote California Candidate Forum. Thank you all so much for joining us. My name is Ed Herzl. I'm the program assistant for um, Disability Voices United, which is one of our coalition members. Um, I am about to start live streaming on Facebook, so please stand by. Mm -hmm. Sharon, 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 Right. Leslie will be rejoining us as a panelist. Uh, the Facebook live streaming process is taking a little longer than usual, so I would encourage you, Steve, to go ahead and get started in case the internet uh, throws a hissy fit. Very so, good. Yeah. <laughs> thank, thank you very much, Ed. And, uh, and hello and welcome to all of our viewers. My name is Steve Miller. I'm uh, a proud uh, member of this statewide collaboration, Disability Vote California. Uh, there are more than 36 member organizations and we're all working together on a statewide basis to promote the ability of uh, people to exercise their, their rights in a democracy, to get out and vote, exercise their will. Um, we have a number of different initiatives going on. So I encourage everybody to go to the website, just go to disabilityvoteca.org and you'll see an enormous amount of information and just about every tool that you might need or someone that you, uh, that you know might need in order to get registered, to find out where they can vote and to get, to get the access that we need so that everybody can participate uh, in, this, in this coming election. What we're about right now is beginning a series of conversations with candidates because we know that while it's very important that people are able to get out and exercise their vote, what's equally important is that people have a good idea of what they're voting for and who they're voting for. And quite often, it's difficult to find discussions of the issues that may be most important to people um, who have any connection at all with the disability community. Those critical kitchen table issues that we have don't necessarily make it into the newspapers and, and regular television coverage. So uh, we've reached out to candidates that are running for countywide and statewide and congressional offices and invited them to have conversations with our community, an exchange of ideas where we can learn how they understand our, uh, our interests and our priorities, and we can learn from them how they would represent us if we decide to exercise our vote to send them to office. Um, our committee, the Candidate Engagement Committee, made uh, invitations to a number of local, state, and uh, federal races. It's important to know that for each of these, we made the exact same invitation to both candidates in each of the races. The, the invitations that went out went out at the same day, roughly the same time, and contained exactly the same information. And as people responded, we began to work to find times that would work for them to join in these conversations. Uh, today, we have a, a wonderful opportunity to meet with one of the two candidates running for the second supervisorial district for the Board of Supervisors of Los Angeles County. And um, with that said, I'm going to turn this over to several members, constituents actually, uh, in that second district to begin a conversation with Senate, State Senator Holly Mitchell, who is running for office. So thank you all very much for joining us. And with that, I'd like to turn this over to Emma Ehrenmark. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Emma Ehrenmark. I am a student living in the second district of Los Angeles County. I am a sibling of an incredible young man with autism. My brother has changed who I am and the way I see the world. He constantly reminds me to not take life so seriously, <laughs> to find joy in the little things, and to lead with love. 
Mm. He and so many others with disabilities bring gifts to our world. Four million people in California identify as having a disability, but those people know millions more who love them and want them to achieve their greatest potential. I am here today on behalf of family members and siblings who fight for disability policies that will change the lives of people with disabilities for the better. I am ecstatic to be here today to talk with Senator Holly Mitchell about what she can do to realize this goal and improve the lives of people with disabilities around Los Angeles County. So my first question today is, could you share any personal or public life experiences that help prepare you to understand and represent the interests of people with disabilities? Emma, thank you so much for the invitation uh, and your opening remarks um, and your willingness to share how your brothers changed your life is um, really so important. So thank you for sharing that. And I think my experience uh, as an elected official, I was first elected to the uh, assembly in 2010. Uh, I served on budget subcommittees the entire time up until the point I was appointed chair of the budget committee. And I, and I chaired the health and human services subcommittee where I met amazing family members like yourself. And you are right. Family members are the most fierce, most helpful to me as a policymaker advocates because they put a real face, a real life kind of perspective to the challenges, particularly we were facing back then when I was first elected, where we were still in a recession and many of the services your family members um, are entitled to and need to, to live independently and thrive were being cut. And it was in those moments when parents met with me privately that I heard parents talk about their deep personal fears about their aging children with developmental disabilities and their fears about what would happen to them when their parents were no longer alive to be their fierce advocate. Um, my tours of the uh, DD centers that we were scheduled to close uh, are hours and hours and hours, uh, year after year of conversation about what healthy, appropriate, independent living and independent services look like and should be like in terms of meeting the spectrum of need. Um, uh, I've, I've been um, like you with your experience with your brother. I'm a better person and a better policymaker having had relationship with parents uh, and meeting your family members who are utilizers of those services. It's broadened my perspective and made me a more well-rounded policymaker, I believe. I think that's what I'd say. Um, and my second question is, um, it can sometimes be difficult to see how the actions of individual legislators in Sacramento or Washington make a difference in the day-to-day -day lives of people here in the second district. How are things different for county supervisors? How do you see the cap capability of a county supervisor to have a real impact in the daily lives of county residents with disabilities? I appreciate that question. And I, and I have to say that I felt that I had, have had real impact as a state legislator. When I consider the role I've played in the budget, where we've been able to, um, you know, reverse some of those horrible cuts to reinstate the 7% um, for IHSS workers, um, all of the services that we've been able to, to reconstitute, um, the support of the regional centers. I think at the state level, we have worked very hard hand in hand with the Department of Developmental Disabilities to provide appropriate oversight, to make sure that uh, in these last couple of years that we've increased reimbursements to the provider community, which is really important because that had been ignored far too long. Um, so I think at the state level, I felt like I've had a direct hand. It will be different at the County Board of Supervisors. The county level is the safety net. That's where many of the services we establish at the state level actually are operationalized, are executed at the, at the county level. So it will be a different level of, of direct impact. Um, and the county also with their $36, $37 billion budget also have an opportunity and a responsibility to make sure that they are funding appropriate services um, um, for people, adults and children with developmental disabilities as well. So I think for me at the county level, it's really recognizing 
where all of those services really kind of come home, you know, access, direct access uh, in terms of your Medi-Cal um, services, uh, direct access to all the other benefits that some people may qualify for. You know, we worked very hard to make sure that people who received SSI and SSP could qualify for CalFresh. We set that policy at the state level, it's at the county level where those services are directly um, operationalized. So it, it's, it's more direct access to the program, but I do feel at least at the state level, we've had an opportunity to influence people's lives for the better. Thank you. Ernie, do you have a question for Senator Mitchell? I do, and uh, this is in regards to health care. Uh -huh. Thank you, Senator Mitchell. My name is Ernestine Frazier, and I live in Ladera Heights. And I had the privilege of talking to one of your staff last year, Alex Hernandez, and I definitely <laughs> want to thank you for that opportunity also. Great, great. And I'm participating in this talk on behalf of my son, who is disabled, and of course, for all the people throughout Los Angeles County who have similar challenges or simply love someone who does. <laughs> I have a question about healthcare. It comes from a young lady who could not be a part of the talk herself today. I think the situation is similar to many others, so I hope you can speak to it. Okay. And this is her background with the question. I have to deal with quite a few serious health challenges on an ongoing basis. It's just a part of my life that I'm used to. And so I'm not really talking about me personally, but how my challenges are like so many other people too. Because of my medical issues, I have to be seen and treated by a couple of specialists on a regular basis. Several years ago, there was a change in the Medi-Cal system. The hospital and doctors I had been using who knew me and I trusted them were no longer available. To me, this was a really horrible thing to deal with. For two years, I couldn't find specialists that would see me on a regular basis. So I had to continuously go to the emergency room to get the medical attention that I need to live. I can't tell you how stressful and scary this is for someone who has serious medical conditions. Thankfully, I have been able to straighten things out for myself, but I know that there are thousands of people who have the same kinds of problems. Many of them still have a really hard time finding chosen and preferred doctors and specialists who will treat them and give them the health care that they need. So the question, what can be done to make it easier for people with serious medical conditions to get the medically necessary health care that they deserve? And what can you do to help increase the number of primary care and specialty doctors so people don't? have to wait months and make long trips to find the care that they need. Uh, on behalf of that person, thank you, Ms. Frazier, um, for setting that up and teeing that up and giving us the context. And she's so right. She's unfortunately not unique. That is really kind of some of the structural barriers that many people have experienced with Medi-Cal. And I have to say, you know, before I first ran for office and before I was the CEO of Crystal Stairs, I was a special interest advocate for the Western Center on Law and Poverty and worked on expanding the Medi-Cal program and making it easier to apply, making sure as many benefits were included in it as possible. And Medi-Cal is one of the best health care products one can have in terms of what it will cover. It really is. The legislature has worked very hard to maintain that. And during the recession, before I got to the assembly, uh, when the state was broke, quite frankly, you know, there were lots of cuts to the Medi-Cal program. They reduced the provider reimbursement rate. And in the last seven to eight years, we have worked 
in collaboration with hospitals and the health plans and the clinics and the doctors and nurses and the specialists to increase the reimbursement rate. It really is low. And I know um, managing the Medi-Cal program, if you are a run a small clinic or you're a, a doctor in private practice, it's onerous. And so we've worked very hard to try to increase the Medi-Cal reimbursement rate through the managed care occupancy tax, the MCO tax, through Prop 56 that some of you may have voted for. So there's more money in the public health care system so we can reimburse these providers and the specialists at a high enough rate that they can be Medi-Cal providers. Uh, you know, I get it from both ends. We hear it from the doctors um, about you know, I, it, it costs me more to be a Medi-Cal provider than I get reimbursed, and that's not fair. And so we have worked really hard to increase that reimbursement rate so we will have enough providers in the system to provide the high-quality care that I believe Medi-Cal can and does perform. The other thing that she may have experienced, you know, there was a, you know, we've transitioned Medi-Cal from fee-for-service to a managed care plan. Um, for cost savings and for measurable quality outcomes. And there were certain populations that were carved out of the, the managed care transition for many years, seniors and people with developmental disabilities, just so you could maintain your relationship with your longstanding health provider if they were not gonna transition themselves from fee to service to managed care. And in, in the last few years, the State Department of Healthcare Services has you know, said, okay, it's time to move from fee-for-service into managed care. And so there was a point in time when seniors and the DD community was really like, wait, you mean I can't continue to go to my doctor and my specialist that I've had these long-term relationships with? And that was a really bumpy road, I get it. But I think that we've managed our way through that and they're all kind of nonprofit organizations, uh, many of whom are in your coalition, who stepped up and were health navigators to help people navigate the kind of administrative burden of trying to pick a new healthcare provider or physician or making sure your old physician then transitioned into managed care. On the county side, you know, the county health department and public health department are some of the largest health departments in the country. And at the county level, it is a awesome responsibility with huge health facilities. Uh, so I'm looking forward if I have the pleasure of being elected to the Board of Supervisors, to take my 10 years of experience at the state level, working with Medi-Cal and all these unique kind of populations to the county level to make sure I can provide that same kind of commitment and direction and leadership at the county health service delivery system. You know, the county relies heavily on Medi-Cal um, to help fund its healthcare services. And so making sure that the county um, residents who rely on the county health system have access to high quality healthcare providers and specialists is very important to me. So that's the experience that I hope to bring from the state to the county to make access to healthcare services at the county much better. Continuing to work to make sure we pay providers and have a system that benefits everyone. Thank you, Senator Holly. Thank you very much, Ms. Frazier. It's a pleasure meeting you. Uh, before we jump to the next question, I just have a little bit of a follow-up. Um, as, as I was listening, as I was listening um, to, to Ernie and putting myself in the um, shoes of the individual uh, mm -hmm. experiencing that, I, I recognize that so often um, people that, that uh, uh, people with disabilities um, find themselves falling through cracks in large systems that are established to serve most people well. And I understand there does have to be some, we'll do the best we can for everybody, but typically people with really significant medical challenges, mental health challenges, a variety of challenges, have unique situations that the big systems don't deal with very well. You know that from your advocacy days, I know. My question is really following up this, how, how could the Board of Supervisors, how would you um, make sure that there was some kind of a process that hears people when they have really difficult situations and can make a big system respond to an individual need like this? 
That's a great question, Steve. And, you know, as I'm listening to your question, you know, from my perspective, that's the fundamental role of government. It's the role of government to make sure that those who are most vulnerable with the greatest need don't fall through the cracks. That's the whole concept in my mind of a safety net. The county government is the safety net. We are designed and the intention is to catch you to make sure that there aren't big institutional gaps. And I think, you know, having worked at Western Center on Law and Poverty, I know the value of the legal services world and the healthcare advocacy world and all the ombuds persons that we funded at the state level to be kind of the point person and to be the voice to view our systems and provide input into how they should and must be improved so we don't have big gaps in services. And so it's really making sure that within every of the 30 plus departments at the county, every department, that there is someone, some office, some touch point to make sure that that's the lens through which they are providing input to the board and the overall county structure to make sure that people aren't falling through the cracks. You know, case in point, we have the ombuds person in this skilled nursing home facility kind of world who are the intermediaries between families, if you've got complaints, and policymakers, so we understand what really goes on in those spaces. Um, and so I think, I think every county department should have that person, that unit, um, that that's their fundamental role. If there's time, we'll follow up at the end. I agree with you that that's how it should work. Um, there are five members of the Board of Supervisors and each of you can be the people that knit that safety net more tightly together or I agree. recognize where there's a hole and can act decisively to try to pull that net together and save people from falling through it. That's I absolutely agree. And, and I think our role at the board is to make sure that there is a level in each department that makes that kind of autopilot, that it's ingrained in the culture of each county department. Um, so, it, so it happens. So it, it is an, a natural part of how those departments function and how they design systems to deliver services to the 10 million residents of LA County. I agree with you. Uh, I'm just hoping that it becomes really a part of the, the, the county culture of you will, if you will, in terms of service delivery. Thank you. And I've taken up more of your time and everyone's time that I meant to. Uh, <laughs> Wesley, are you on board for a question? Yes. How are you doing, Senator Demetrio? How are you doing? Fine. Thank you, Mr. Witherspoon. Hi, my name is Wes Witherspoon. I live in Los Angeles and I work at USC. I help people how to be self-advocates and also help people work out problems and find the help they need. I have questions about how can we make things safer for people with disabilities if the sheriff or police think they're, they might be violent, but they're not really violent. They just do not want to talk or do not have, know what the police are asking them to do. I have seen this on the news where people with disabilities have been shot by the police because the police thought they were criminals, but they weren't criminals, they were disabled. So what can you do to stop this from happening to people? Wesley, thank you for that important, timely question. Senator Bell and myself held a special hearing maybe six, seven years ago, and the LA County Sheriff at the time attended, the Commissioner for Highway Patrol attended, and we really wanted to talk about what law enforcement needed to be better prepared to deal with um, situations they find themselves in that they frankly aren't prepared or equipped and understand when they encounter uh, someone who's autistic and is not responsive, when they encounter someone who is deaf or hard of hearing um, and does not respond. And so we had a really meaningful public hearing right there in Expo Park um, where people came and presented and talked about their fears of law enforcement, people who suffer from mental illness, um, and out of that came a piece of legislation that Senator Bell and I co-authored that put more funding into post training, peace officer standard and training. We uh, allocated funding and stipulated the number of hours that every law enforcement officer would have to go through to help them understand 
the unique circumstances and the diversity and the complexity of the developmentally disabled community. That it's not always going to be apparent. Um, it's one thing if someone is visually impaired and they have a white cane. That's that's a signal to you that they that they are visually impaired. But that's not always going to be that obvious to law enforcement. And so we worked really hard to try to make sure that they had the tools and resources and training to understand. But you know, Wesley, we're consent continuing to see um, excessive use of force, and I think it's a part of a greater issue around police officer excessive use of force for a variety of communities. Uh, the black community, brown community, communities that are over-policed, typically po poor neighborhoods, as well as those with developmental disabilities. So this is an ongoing issue that we have to hold law enforcement accountable. I was proud to co-author the bill with Shirley Weber, AB392, that really tried to define, the to narrow the, the, the frequency with which and the circumstances that a law enforcement officer could use excessive force. They have to stop and assess the situation as opposed to merely reacting. And so that's the work I did with Senator Bale, the work I continue to do. I agree with you, it is um, a trend that is increasing and not slowing down, and that worries me deeply. As a member of the Board of Supervisors, I would continue the work I've done the past 10 years to really make sure that the county sheriff and the men and women who constitutes the sheriff department understand the unique complexities of our community, that they are supported by having the training and the resources they need to do better, right? In terms of their roles and responsibility in maintaining public safety. Because if we can't trust them, public safety is compromised. And they have to understand that, as so do I. Also, I have another question. Okay. I have heard that some people who have mental health problems get arrested and go to jail. This is really scary because someone who has a mental health problem should not go to jail. They should be, they could get hurt in jail. They should get help and treatment instead of going to jail. So what can you do to help people with mental health problems and other problems get help instead of going to jail? And I agree with you, Wesley, and we're seeing that happen far too often. The former sheriff said at this hearing that I told you about that LA County Men's Jail was the largest mental health facility in the country. He acknowledged that far too many of the men in county jail uh, suffered from mental illness. And it was a result of their lack of treatment, uh, lack of access to programs and services and support that often ended, that led, led them to end up in jail. And that's a problem. And jail or an emergency room, I, I would argue, is the last place a person should be who is experiencing a mental health crisis. That's not the place to be. It's not conducive to your healing and support. Those are scary, scary places. And so the county is really beginning to do a much better job, as is every level of government, of understanding that. You know, police are often involved because we don't, people don't know what else to do or where else to call. That news report we saw where the mother of the son with autism who called the police just because she couldn't handle him, because she didn't have another resource to call. She didn't have uh, any kind of emergency intervention specialist who understands um, the unique characteristics of people with autism to call that person and say, help me managing, he's in the middle of an episode and I need help. Um, we have to, we as government, county level and the state level, have to create these other systems to give people other options to get help when they need it as a result of just relying on the police. That's not police work. And so we should reserve true police work which is fighting criminal activity for police and issues that, in, that, that social workers, psychologists, psychiatrists, mental health professionals, homeless care coordinators are better equipped to do, substance abuse counselors. We've got to make sure those resources and those people are, are equipped and ready and are in a position to respond to the public when we need them. A bill just passed that the governor signed recently to set up a pilot program to do that kind of work. 
I, in fact, let me take it back. He didn't sign it. He didn't sign it. It was going to be a pilot program, and I think he vetoed it, which is unfortunate because we all, every community across the state needs that. We need an alternative to the police when our family, friends, and neighbors are experiencing mental health crises and they need help and support. I have a question about transportation. Mm -hmm. The availability of accessible public transportation affords people with disabilities the rights and potential to fully participate in the community. Mm -hmm. We face the challenge that these possibilities do not exist for everyone who is entitled to them. Accessible transportation providers are unable to keep up with rider requests due to limited funding. At the same time, fixed bus routes typically run too infrequently to enable people to count on them for work or for critical appointments. If you are elected, how will you work with our community to understand the critical importance of public transportation and what will you do to ensure its availability where and when needed? Great question. And you know, the LA County Board of Supervisors, each member uh, has an appointee to the Metro board and serves on the Metro board. They kind of rotate in and out. And, you know, Metro and the expansion of the train system in LA County is really gonna be liberating for so many communities. Um, and this is the community that also should be empowered by um, our, our newfound uh, commitment and commitment to fund public transportation. You know, LA, we, we are behind the times. We are behind most modern civilization when it comes to public, true public transportation that people can rely on confidently to get to their doctor's appointments, to get to work, get to school. And so Metro is building out. Um, and I think that is the prime opportunity to make sure that in, in every design element, in every expansion element, in the discussions around routes, in the discussion around fares, in the discussion around policing on the trains, that this perspective must be uh, included. You know, if it's a position on the Metro board to provide direct uh, governance decisions, um, those are the kinds of things I think that the board can lead on, um, making sure that as we expand and improve L the, the LA region's public transit, that we don't leave the developmentally disabled community behind. It's too important. Senator. Holly Mitchell, the housing costs all over Los Angeles continues to rise far beyond the reach of anyone living on a low income. For many adults with disabilities who live on SSI or on very low wages, finding housing is simply impossible. Section 8 certificates are almost unobtainable. So Los Angeles County has identified thousands of people with disabilities among their homeless population. Mm -hmm. Due to a lack of affordable housing, a majority of adults with developmental disabilities continue to live with their aging parents. So my question, if you're elected to represent us, how will you work to ease this housing crisis for people with disabilities and what is your position with respect to increasing funding for Section 8 rent subsidies? Ms. Frazier, you've hit the nail right on the head. You know, we are 500,000 housing units short for the entire county for every population that's in need. And so when you consider vulnerable populations, low income, people with developmental disabilities, their need is even intensified. And so we have to build. We have to, we have to relieve the pressure point in terms of not having enough housing for everybody. I fully support increasing um, Section 8 vouchers. You know, that's a federal program. Uh, but what I did most significantly in this last year was to make sure that property owners weren't um, discriminating against people based on being a Section 8 voucher holder. You've seen the ads, two bedroom, one bath, no Section 8. And so even many people who had vouchers couldn't get housing because they couldn't find a landlord who would rent to them. Uh, the Mitchell bill made that illegal. And so we will no longer see no Section 8 accepted. Every landlord has to at least allow the Section 8 applicant to apply 
And then the landlord gets to decide okay. who they think is the best fit for their property. That was a major, major issue uh, that impacted all voucher holders, veterans who have vouchers, as well as Section 8 voucher holders. Making sure that we are building appropriate housing and affordable housing is really critical. 93% of all new housing construction in the city of LA over the last 10 years, 93% was market rate. And so every new housing development, I believe, has to have a set aside at least 20% for affordable. And we have to really be clear about what we mean by affordable. Affordable should be defined based on what the residents of that community can afford. I've worked very hard as budget chair since I've been in the legislature to also increase the SSI, SSP monthly rate. You know, we can't expect people to be able to live independently um, when we are paying them at such a low rate. You know, the county of LA has an adjusted general relief in 30 years. And so we have to look at increasing SSI SSP and creating COLA so we can be matched to inflation. So people have enough more money in their pocket upon which to live. We have to build more housing and be creative and create set asides for our vulnerable populations, including those living with developmental disabilities. I think we also need to really fund in a meaningful way independent living which includes job coaches and all the training that goes along with living independent successfully. We've taken money out of those programs too. And I think that's equally as important for people to not only afford housing, but to be able to stay in housing um, and, and thrive. Those are the things um, I would do as a member of the Board of Supervisors that I think are very important. And it's working with multiple levels of government to make all that happen. Section 8 vouchers, that value was set at the federal level. The county needs to do a better job of making sure we are held getting, going through that list so people don't have to wait 10, 20 years to actually get their Section 8 voucher when they already qualify and make sure that we have landlords that will accept it so the whole system really is supportive to the people who are entitled to housing, which is everybody in my opinion. Thank you. Thank you. So I've been um, I've been getting a number of, of emails uh, since people learned that we were going to be having these sessions, and so there are some questions that that I think maybe were sent to me um, that didn't get into the general filter. So if you don't mind, I'll ask one. But any other panelists, if something else occurs to you, um, Senator Mitchell, if something occurs to you, just feel uh, fine about ignoring my question and going on uh, with whatever um, seems most important. Um, but I've gotten a number of, of uh, emails regarding in-home support services mm -hmm. uh, and from a, a variety of different perspectives. Hmm. And I guess the first part of it ties in with the whole COVID public health emergency we're, we're having now. Mm -hmm. uh, IHSS workers are vitally essential workers. Yes, they are. And the agencies, in some cases, there are agencies that co that co-employ with uh, the county to mm -hmm. hire IHSS workers and, and deploy them to meet the needs of people. Um, in all of these cases, we know that we're not doing a good job of taking care of essential workers, direct support workers. We're not paying them well enough. We don't. We're we're overstressing them. When, and I know this, this is a lot of the money comes from the state and the feds, mm -hmm. but as a member, if you become a member of the county board of supervisors, what, what can you do to make this system work better for the people that are depending on it? I appreciate that question. And, and what I did and have done always is, was to fight the cuts um, to IHSS and to, to make good on the promise that once um, the, the general fund was in a healthier state that we reversed all those cuts and put their hours back. Um, I know that there was a bill that I supported this year to provide sick time and unemployment insurance um, to IHSS workers. And so it really is valuing um, the profession and recognizing that they are essential. 
one thing we were able to do in the interim as an emergency in the middle of COVID was to really include them in the category of essential workers. So they qualified for childcare a subsidy. In many instances, they didn't. So we put them at the top of the list to make sure they qualified for subsidy. And to add them to the list of essential workers to have access to PPE, protective equipment. I think initially in the, the beginning of the crisis, people thought about hospitals and doctors and nurses, but we had to broaden our definition of who was at risk. Uh, folks working in nursing homes, uh, CAs, um, IHSS workers, and child care providers for that, for that matter. And so I've worked with a number of my colleagues in the LA County delegation, where we uh, wrote personal checks, sought donations, and, and created a, this process where we worked with um, BizFed um, and have provided protective equipment uh, in partnership with SCIU and AFSCME um, to their members, uh, working in private homes as well as in skilled nursing facilities. But she, that, you know, that's a stopgap measure. That was what we all did as a pylon and in, in, in the middle of a crisis. As a policymaker, my job is to make sure that the systems, the structure doesn't forget them permanently. So we did the immediate, got them PPE, but then we had to make sure that as the state um, negotiated this contract to get millions of units of masks and um, uh, um, protective gowns, that the skilled nursing facilities and IHSS workers were a part of that distribution as well. That's where the counties plug in in terms of distributing it across the county. That's the work I would continue to do, the advocacy that I've e exemplified at the state that I would continue to do with the county. You know, the county is the, in many instances, as you said, the direct employer and really acknowledging. And I think COVID has sensitized everybody to what the essential workforce really looks like. And in all honesty, it's largely people mm. of color and poor people. And so I believe that policymakers and the general public are gonna have different expectations and different demands on how we honor people who are essential to our survival and making sure we increase their rate of pay, making sure we provide basic worker protections like sick time, um, um, so you don't have to worry about how you feed your family if you think that you may be ill. Um, how we provide all of those, I believe, necessary worker protections to this category of worker as well. Um, you know, in many instances that, that those are um, labor negotiated agreements between government and the unions that represent them. And I think that the county should step up and acknowledge what a critical role they play. Um, uh, and they truly are essential and make those worker protections available to them. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Senator Mitchell. I really appreciate it. I just like to, and I, I just want to say that I think you're, I think you're exactly right. Um, and I would like to turn our attention now to the Q and A portion um, of the Zoom webinar. There are two questions in the Q and A from Catherine Patel. Uh, the first question is, what was the name of the bill the governor vetoed regarding the pilot program for an emergency intervention specialist? Ms. Patel, I am very bad on bill numbers, but I can tell you it was a, an assembly member, Sydney Camlogger bill. Hmm. I can't remember the bill number, but if you call her office, you can get the details about the bill and the bill number. And I've already seen her on social media saying she will be back at it. Uh, to carry that bill again. And I think it's an important element of what we all know to be true, that we have to create systems in which we have people to call when people are in crisis. So we have an option other than to call the police. And I don't know the bill number, I'm sorry, but call the assembly member's office. Thank you very much. And for the second question from Mark Anthony Campoy, I would like to ask a question. My name is Mark Anthony Campoy and I am an instructor from the Ex Exceptional Children's Foundation at Hyde and Centenia. My question is how will the Senator, if elected, make the area safer? Three years ago, I advocated for my participants um, of, of a cognitive, I'm not sure what that word is, um, on putting down a slowdown sign. Um, however, mm -hmm. the city only placed a, dip si a disability, thank you, Mark. Um, uh, however, the city only placed a dip sign 
what other options are available to control the traffic. I can tell you that I've had to dodge several cars from being run over when I crossed to Centennial Avenue. Very good question. And I think the, the clarification I would need is if the area is in unincorporated LA County. You know, if it's in the city of LA, then that really is a city issue. But if it's an unincorporated LA County, then the County Board of Supervisors is your local level of government. So we would absolutely have the opportunity to step in to make sure that you have all of the signage that you need to be safe. And there's a whole process that you have to go through. I've seen it in my own neighborhood where neighborhoods have requested um, um, speed bumps or humps or dips. You know, they all have varying degrees of height. Um, there's no, an, an entire analysis that's done to determine um, what's best for that area. And so at the county level, I would absolutely be an advocate to make sure that every community is safe for pedestrians, particularly areas that surround schools or um, special or organizations that are providing um, um, services to people uh, with special needs. And so that would be the responsibility of the Board of Supervisors if that were in an unincorporated area of Los Angeles County. Thank you very much, Senator Mitchell. Um, at this time, I would like to open the Spanish line for any questions. We do have uh, Spanish interpretation going on in the back line and Lorna Silva, our interpreter, uh, I, I would like to ask Lorna if she would ask the Spanish line if there are any questions for Senator Mitchell. Um, and in the meantime, while she is asking that, I would like to advertise to all of you that we will be having a second, uh, a second candidate forum let me pull up the information here so that I do not give anybody the, inc the incorrect information. We will be having a conversation with candidate Lanira Murphy at 3 p.m. Uh, and I really encourage all of you to, to, to come and join us for that as well. Um, and on Tuesday, we will also be having a candidate forum with assembly member uh, Nazarian. Uh, there are no questions on the Spanish line, so I would like to turn it back to our panelists at this point. Thank you very much, Senator Mitchell. Thank you. Emma, do you have any uh, additional questions? I don't, but I just wanted to thank Senator Holly Mitchell for being here and I learned so much. Thank you so much. And I just wanna say very fast, um, we, Wesley and I are on the outreach committee on with Disability Vote California and we have put a couple links in the chat on registering to vote and filling out the census, which is very important. Thank you for that, Emma. We've just received another question in the Q&A that I would like to pose to Senator Mitchell, uh, oh. from Jessica Baker. Senator Mitchell, I'm a case manager at a work training facility in Inglewood for adults with disabilities, and our goal is community employment for, for participants. How could you help increase awareness for job placements within the community for people with disabilities? Thank you, Jessica. Jessica, great question. And I think I mentioned early about, you know, job coaches, recognizing that there are places and people like you who are out there um, trying to provide this um, um, assistance. You know, outreach is so important. What is most painful to me for my 10 years as being a policymaker, we may have worked hard, hard, hard to create a new policy or fund some new amazing thing. And my constituents just don't know about it. And so I think it's important for us to work collaboratively with all of the groups represented in Disability Votes California to make sure that we are using perhaps technology like this to get the word out. And I appreciate that outreach costs money. We may need to run ads or radio commercials. I think that we need to think creatively and come together to figure out what it takes to do that. And sometimes I have colleagues in the legislature who, who think spending money on public relations or outreach is a waste. And I disagree. If people don't know about the services that are available to them, and quite frankly, most of my constituents who are, live in vulnerable communities sometimes don't have access to the information, it is worth the investment of public funds to get the word out. And I think that with technology, and, and given what we've all learned as a result of COVID that we can gather and share information like today's webinar, we have to think creatively about how we get that information out. But I agree, and sometimes government falls short that we don't fund outreach. Um, and I think that needs to change. The, the programs are only as good as they are utilized by the people who are entitled to have access to those services. And so I would do all I could to push that information out. I have a, 
a follow-up question about employment. Um, it turns out that the largest single employer in Los Angeles County is? The county. The county. <laughs> around 90,000 people are employed by the county. Mm -hmm. And then when you take into account all of the dollars that the county spends with vendors, private enterprise through services and goods mm -hmm. produced for the, for the county, mm -hmm. uh, it seems that the county itself could become one of the major employers of people with a wide range of disabilities. Uh, disabled vets, um, people with developmental disabilities, people with orthopedic disabilities. We know that the capabilities far exceed any kind of disability. And the biggest problem we have in changing the unemployment rate is finding employers who are willing to take uh, very reasonable and modest steps to make accommodations work. You mentioned job coaches. Um, I have, uh, I served on the LA County Board of Supervisors appointed commission on, on disabilities for many years. And we mm -hmm. tried very hard and we worked with wonderful people in HR and wonderful department heads. But it seems that the um, policies that exist make it mm -hmm. so difficult to create the kinds of openings to be, to be creative mm -hmm. and make something happen. Again, if, if, if you're elected and you take this as something that you could do something about, how, how could you act to cut through some of the difficulties that bureaucracies have to be a responsive uh, employer for people with disabilities? You know, Steve, I, I appreciate you sharing that history and, and what you found your barrier to be because leadership starts at the top. And I have seen it. I've exercised that, that power. I have used my bully pulpit to affect very similar kind of changes. You know, there was a, a, a point in time in our society and culture where people coming out of prison and jail had a hard time getting jobs. Uh, I worked for the legislature doing welfare reform and really trying to push private industry to give, you know, former welfare recipients a shot. Um, and it requires a culture shift. It requires the person at the top leadership saying, make it so. Exactly. Period. Make it so. And, you know, I'm always just surprised when I look across sectors at so many examples of when one person can make the difference in creating that culture shift. I appreciate that there are HR policies and, and policies in place to protect workers and the county doesn't want to be responsible if someone gets injured or hurt on the job. I get all that. But it's about culture shift and making sure that we are practicing what we preach as policymakers, passing policies that we hold private industry accountable to, that we should step up to the plate as well. And so for me, that would be an easy thing to do, you know, starting with my own staff, if I'm lucky enough to be elected and making sure that my own staff reflects the diversity uh, um, of talent across LA County. Uh, so sometimes you have to set an example and sometimes you have to be comfortable in your professional power to exert it and simply make it so. Thank you. Panelists, again, I don't mean to uh, take up too much airtime. Are there any other panelists that, that want to follow up with any questions? We have a few more minutes with the center. Okay, then it's back to me. <laughs> Let me say this. I, I know that we are blessed to have two candidates who have worked hard in their communities. Um, uh, and, and so I would address this to, to, to both. You have in your blood and in your history being an advocate. Mm -hmm. And when you look at what it would mean to be a member of the County Board of Supervisors, one of the most powerful public positions probably in the country, give us some sense of where we could hold you accountable to be an advocate for this disability. What, and I know you can't make promises that, that you don't have any ability no. to deliver, but tell right. us where we would see you in action, and how, we could, how we could watch the next supervisor in the second district actually, actually fight for the needs and the interests of people with disabilities. Well, Steve, I would just ask everyone to look at my, my past history. Um, you know, for me, this race is not about political ambition. 
I'm not termed out. It's not that I don't have any place to go. Uh, I still have a couple years left of my Senate term. For me, this is about my life's work and the work I have trained to do. Running the largest subsidized childcare um, organization in the state, working on behalf of low-income families and providing supports to vulnerable children. My years as an advocate with the Western Center on Law and Poverty, 10 years as a legislator, five as budget chair. I have a very public track record um, from actions I have led uh, in the budget to bills I've carried. I have a very public track record that chronicles um, my trajectory um, and allows you to match my actions with my words. And so I would encourage people to take a look at that. Um, we have to elect the next supervisor that has the relevant skill set to the work that the county does. Uh, I'm running against uh, my opponent, has served in public office for many, many years. The question before us is who is prepared, who has the experience to do the work of the county? And I believe the work of the county has begun to shift. So I tip my hat to the current members of the Board of Supervisors that it is shifting more towards understanding the role we play to provide help and hope to people in crisis instead of merely prosecuting and jailing. And that's my lane, Mr. Miller. That's the work I've done my entire professional career and what attracts me to the power and opportunity in this position, particularly in the second district, recognizing that while it is a district with amazing communities and rich assets, it is also a community that is at the center of many of the tough, toughest challenges facing Los Angeles County around housing affordability, around food deserts, around access to health services and mental health services, around over-policing and a disproportionate experience, negative experience with law enforcement. Those are all issues that all of us who live in the second district experience every waking day. That's why I'm running and why I'm hoping I can count on the residents of the second district to give me the opportunity to serve them as their next supervisor. Thank you so much, Sen oh, I'm, so, I'm sorry to cut you off. I was just gonna say, with regard to accountability, I appreciate it. And it's important that we all take responsibility for that. You know, these are two-way relationships. I am a public servant. And so accountability is, you know, you too have a responsibility and obligation to hold me accountable by being an active participant in your governance by showing up to hearings, by writing and communicating with me to express your perspective. Uh, I have represented an amazing district, both in the Assembly and the Senate, of engaged residents who I hear from, who use every medium to communicate to me, to support me when they support what I've done, and to tell me when, from their perspective, I could have done better or different. And so I open myself up and ask the public, to see my record, know my record. Um, I'm on social media, I'm on Facebook, giving people opportunity to see my work in real time. I am not a behind the scenes, closed door, back door dealing policymaker. That's not who I've ever been or who I aspire to ever be. That's a marvelous call to action for us. We need to be part of the conversation. We need to be at the table. We need to watch you. We need to watch elected officials and we need to tell you that we're here and there are lots of us and we vote when we care. Thank, Thank you. you. Go ahead. Thank I'm you sorry. so much. Uh, we are, we should be ending right about now. Senator Mitchell, I want to ask if you have time to just answer just one more question in the chat. Yes, of so, course. Thank you very much. Uh, Anna Marie says, Senator Mitchell, how can we get more funding for our programs to provide better services for our participants? There could be so much more we could do in providing services as a job coach, but there is not room in the budget for it. I made the decision to run for the assembly in 2008 as the CEO of Crystal Stairs while sitting in the budget subcommittee hearing where they were proposing to cut $1 billion out of childcare. And I sat there in that moment in real time and got mad enough to run because I knew that I had a perspective, a life experience, a community that I worked with every day 
that I didn't feel was being reflected in those deliberations. There was a missing element. So I ran for office. And so as Mr. Miller says, he has seen me and he knows that I consider myself an activist policymaker. I don't refer to myself as a politician. I had someone in the community my first year said, don't let them call you that. That's not what you are. You're a policymaker. And I thought about it and I said, that's the truth. And I'm an activist policymaker. And so people have to engage. And the, the reason I was interested in the budget, and from that moment in time when I decided to run, two years later I'm elected, guess who was chairing that very same budget subcommittee? And stayed as chair of that committee until I became chair of the overall budget. Because I knew bringing resources to vulnerable communities, to my constituents was the most effective way I could be a leader. So that's why I chair budget. That's why that's the lane I find myself in because resources are what we need to be competitive and to thrive. We could write the best bill ever written in the world. And if it doesn't have resources to, to make it implementable or put teeth in it, it's just nice words on paper. And so it's joining, you know, being a part of all of the numerous stakeholder groups that spent a lot of time in Sacramento, spent a lot of time with the, body, the Board of Supervisors, influencing these decisions around how we allocate funds. People talk about special interests and stakeholder groups. They're not all bad, that's you. Right. And so you have a responsibility to come to me, to partner with us, to help us understand. I have a, re a responsibility to, to share with you, as I did for many years when I said, there is no money. This is where we are. How do we make the cuts least harmful for those few years where we still had to make cuts? And then I could come to you and say, we've got resources. How do we now reinvest in these vulnerable critical services? Uh, that's what we did painstakingly in the regional centers um, for the early start program with kids to make sure that they had their um, diagnoses early so they could get treatment. So those were the kinds of investments that were very important to me. And the minute that there were state resources available, we funded those programs again. But that's because of partnership. What I've learned from you all, parent advocates, um, client advocates, uh, that's the importance of relationship and consistent communication, not just during election season, but all the time. So we have relationship. You know that you've educated me and informed me. Uh, and, and I, too, have educated and make sure you have the resources you need to be effective advocates on behalf of your family members and yourselves. I think that's how we get it done. Thank you, Senator Mitchell. And I, and I really want to thank Wesley and Ernie and Emma and Ed and, the, and everyone that's, that's participated in making this event um, as productive and useful as it's been. Thank you so much, Senator Mitchell. Thanks. Me too. My thanks to all of you as well for giving me the opportunity to engage in this really important public policy conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Senator Mitchell. Thank you so much. I appreciate all the candid answers and I thank you also and I'm looking forward to what's coming with you. Mrs. Frazier, thank you very much. I appreciate your kind words. Everybody be safe. Wear your mask. This is my Halloween costume this year. <laughs> <laughs> my son said I can't put it on till the middle of October, but you know I'm itching to wear it. Wear your <laughs> masks. Thanks all. Thank you very much, Senator Mitchell. I urge everyone to join us at 3 p.m. Have, have a great day, everyone, and please do stay safe and wear your mask.